Hi, everybody. Welcome to Shasai Podcast, conversations between scholars from around the world who study childhood, youth, and related institutions historically. As an official production of the Society for the History of Children and Youth, you can subscribe to these shows through iTunes or Google Play. Written and visual materials associated with each episode are available at our website, shcy.org. Enjoy. I'm Dr. Aaron Yarmel, and I'm the Associate Director of the Center for Ethics and Human Values at The Ohio State University. For the next hour or so, I'm going to be interviewing Dr. Mon Gregory and Dr. Megan Laverty about their new book, Gareth B. Matthews, The Child's Philosopher, which came out in 2022. Um, and this is the second in the Philosophy for Children Founders series that they edit together for Rutledge. Uh, Dr. Gregory is a professor of educational foundations at Montclair State uh, University and director of the Institute for the Advancement of Philosophy for Children. Dr. Laverty is Associate Professor of Philosophy and Education at Teachers College, Columbia University. Last year, they presented about the new book at a conference of the Society for the History of Children and Youth, and were invited to have it be a featured book on the SCHY website, which is what brings us together today. Welcome, Dr. Laverty and Dr. Gregory. Yeah, so I'm really excited to, to have this conversation. I've, I've been a big fan of you know, both of your works for a long time. And I, also, like both of you have had a really big influence on me personally, just through through the Mendham Summer Institute. So I was really honored to be able to facilitate this this conversation. So I'm going to start with a question uh, directed at uh, Mong. And the question is this, could you just tell us about philosophy for children and why you thought it was important to produce a series on its founders? Yeah, thanks. Uh, well, philosophy, philosophy as a school subject uh, at the secondary level, the high school level has been, you know, something... Uh, very common um, all around the world for centuries, really. Uh, but the idea of doing philosophy with younger children uh, really took off in the late 60s, early 70s uh, in the northeastern United States. Um, and uh, the movement has grown since then um, to sort of uh, incorporate and work with high school philosophy programs. Um, and so now there's this worldwide network of people doing philosophy from preschool through high school in all different kinds of ways. And um, the name is Matthew Lippmann. Primarily the name of Matthew Lippmann is, is well known around the world. Um, and a lot of people think that sort of he is the one who sort of single-handedly created this field. And um, we worked closely with Matt at the Institute and uh, with his colleague, Ann Sharp. And um, Ann, uh, died when she was uh, in her early 70s, um, soon after she retired and uh, before she had a chance to sort of uh, look back on her work and, and you know, put things together in, in a publishable way. And so we wanted, that's something we wanted to do for her because we knew that um, uh, in addition to being an, an amazing teacher and facilitator of philosophical dialogue, Anne was also a scholar and that her work was really not very well known uh, for a number of reasons. And so we really wanted to put a book for her, uh, about her together. Um, and then we had such a good time doing it and um, the book was successful enough that we decided to, to keep going. And so to, to try to revive interest in, uh, in some of the people who were the first theorizers and, and people who developed this field. Tell, tell, us, tell us a little bit about uh, Matthew's role as a founder of the Philosophy for Children movement. Do you see him primarily as a researcher, a theorist, a P4C facilitator or, or something else? Yeah, so thanks for that question, Aaron. Um, you know, I think um, Gareth Matthews was primarily a philosopher. Um, he was um, interested in and researched in and wrote about ancient and medieval philosophy. But then when he had his own kids, he got really interested in how well what he discovered was that they were sort of asking philosophical questions and engaging in philosophical reflections and he also realized as he was reading picture books to them that a lot of the picture books he was reading um, were themselves sort of deeply philosophical so that was going on at the same time that he was really worried about his 
college students and the sense that the college students had, um, you know, the deep suspicion the college students had of philosophy. And so one way that he thought to bring these two sort of insights together was to take some of the picture books that he was reading with his children and share them with his college students, kind of use them as a way to do philosophy with his college students. So that really began his interest in um, sort of philosophy and children's literature or how children's literature goes philosophical. And that was sort of relatively new. And based on that, uh, Lippmann asked him to become a contributing editor to the Thinking Journal, which was um, the only philosophy for journal, philosophy for children journal at that time. And um, Matthews ended up, you know, reviewing 58 over the years, 58 picture books. And um, so, so he really was sort of a significant figure in establishing and developing this, this interest or this field of thinking about the philosophy and children's literature. But he was also kind of developing his own approach to philosophizing with children, because once he realized that you could use picture books to philosophize with college students, and once he realized that children were thinking philosophically, he became very, very interested in having philosophical conversations with children, adults, and adolescents. So he, over the course of many decades, he developed his own approach to thinking philosophically with um, young children and his colleagues. So um, in that sense, he was both a kind of theorist and researcher and facilitator. And uh, yeah, I think he was, you know, I think a, an important feature of the book is to just draw attention to how important Matthews is for these different fields. Are there any fun stories that you think our listeners would want to hear? Because it, it sounds like a really exciting life. Like he started to do, you know, children's literature in, in college classrooms. He had these conversations with children. Um, yeah, any, any fun stories you want to share? Yeah, yeah, I can share one um, that I, I have here just because it's such a delightful story. And it's told um, by someone he worked with. And, and these are her words. She says, um, I can remember him, Gareth Matthews, borrowing my kids to talk to. He'd say, I'd love to talk to Will for a little while. I think we'll go into town to Bart's and get an ice cream. And they'd talk because my little guy, Will, was that kind of thinker. He asked Gary one time, Gary, why are beautiful things so sad? And I remember them getting into this big conversation about that. Will became one of the touchstone kids with whom Gary would try out questions. So I, I love that story. And then there's another lovely story um, that... Peter Shea offers, and Peter Shea is one of the contributors to the book, and what he reflects on is um, Gareth Matthews as a teacher, both, you know, as a teacher at the college level and also as a colleague. And I think this is very telling about Matthews' character. Um, he says that Matthews presented a paper at the University of Minnesota, where Peter Shea was, about Augustine's question, can one sin in a dream? Over the next few years, they returned to that discussion whenever they met. And uh, Peter says of Matthews that he, he had a way of setting out a puzzle so that one could work on it. He was also a fine interlocutor, quick to see problems with his own position and to pivot to a new approach or line of inquiry. One always felt one was making progress when one talked to him, although one seldom arrived at any final solution. And by all accounts, Matthews enjoyed such lengthy conversations, sometimes over many years and many decades, on philosophical questions of mutual interest to children, students, and colleagues. And in fact, I think most people felt that Matthews did philosophy, philosophy 
mostly by initiating a shared inquiry rather than holding forth. I hope that people listening to this are going to go pick up the volume and take a look at it because one of the things that I think is coming through with what you just said and really comes through when you read like like Peter Shea's chapter, um, for instance, is just how wonderful of a person like Matthews was and how much of a huge impact he had on an enormous number of people and just the the warmth with which he engaged. So that's, yeah, I think it's really coming through. I'm going to ask one follow-up question, and I'm, I'm really curious, have either of you implemented some of these techniques into your own practice, either sitting silently and waiting for the class to start, or I know I've, I've, I brought Frog and Toad in to a lecture on Aristotle, and that was one thing that this book influenced me to do. So I'm just kind of curious if, if either of you have uh, experimented with some of these techniques in your college teaching. Yeah, I, I've definitely um, been bringing um, picture books into my philosophy of education classes. Um, uh, picture books that um, not that don't even necessarily um, uh, not for philosophical discussion, but picture books that will illustrate and maybe problematize something that we're reading about. You know, some kind of theory like social justice, a, a social justice issue, or um, like the virtues of meditation, or something like that. Um, yeah, I think that the uh, the silence bit also is something that I've really I've gotten more and more into when we're having a discussion in class. Um, I've, I've been, I, I alert my students right away in the beginning of the semester that I, I really value silence and that I don't, when I go silent, I don't intend it to be uh, a way to pressure them into speaking. So I, it's not something we need to fill up, but something we can just sort of all enjoy um, and, and use it as a moment to contemplate what's going on. I think the way in which, one, one of the ways in which Matthew has informed my teaching is I think there can be a temptation to hold forth about a particular issue or about a text. Just you're familiar with it. You've thought about it for a long time and, um, you know, you're inclined to want to share. And it's been a really important discipline for me, I think, to go into classes and really privilege the question and privilege the answers to the question in that moment and try and think with people about those answers and, and evaluate them together as potential answers to the question. Um, and I think if you do that, then the silences do seem more natural because they're part of that process rather than feeling uncomfortable because, you know, either people aren't responding in the way that you hope they would given what you've said or you haven't said enough. So I really have, I feel like that's one lesson I've I've really taken away from doing the book and learning about Matthews as a teacher. So let's let's zoom out and talk about kind of a cool, like like a meta question about the book itself. And what I'm wondering is, you organized the first two books in this series in the same way, and I'm wondering if you could describe that for us. Describe how you organized them, and just talk a little bit about why you organized them in that way. When we decided to do the book on Anne Sharp. Um, we, we knew right away we did not want it to be sort of just a celebration. We wanted it to be a critical reevaluation. We wanted, you know, we wanted her to be taken seriously as a scholar, and the only way to do that is to sort of critically reevaluate her work. And we knew that it would, it would stand up to critical reevaluation, meaning some things would be criticized um, from today's perspective, and some things would be new ideas to certain to some people who were not familiar with her. So in order to do that, the way we figured out to do that was to um, identify the major themes that Anne wrote about and then try to find someone who was an expert on each of those themes to do the critical reevaluation. So we, so we did that, which was great. I mean, we, the first thing we did was um, gather all of her publications and her drafts. Um, I have to say that with both, both of these two first projects, the, the Anne Sharp and the Gareth Matthews, one of the great side benefits that came from this was putting together a complete, we believe complete <laughs> bibliography of their publications in these areas, which didn't exist before. Both of them had um, old CVs, you know, of like 20 years old. Um, and, and even those were not complete. So uh, we, we searched databases, we searched libraries, we wrote to their families, uh, we wrote to colleagues in other countries where they had presented and taught and worked. Um, and Many of them sent us uh, publications that have been published in those countries that we didn't even know about were not available on our databases. 
So did quite a bit of work to just to pull together all of their scholarship. And then, um, and then we looked at it and Megan and I sorted out into, into the major themes, as I said, and then we uh, invited scholars whom we knew were experts in those themes to, um, to write original essays in which they assessed uh, the person's work in that field. Uh, for, um, <clears throat> for Gareth Matthews, let me just read the, the, the themes that we identified for him were uh, philosophy and children's literature, as we've just been talking about, uh, children's philosophical thinking, like what's unique and what's interesting about the way children philosophize, Socratic teaching, um, both, um, uh, both in terms of scholarship, Matthews wrote a book on Socrates and the way, the way people talked, he wrote a little bit about his own teaching and then the way other people have written about him as a teacher, both with children and with college students. Uh, philosophy of developmental psychology was a major theme of his and uh, philosophy of childhood, of course. And those were, by the way, those, those were the themes that Matthews wrote about related to children and childhood, uh, but he was actually better known as a philosopher of uh, ancient and medieval philosophy. All right. So I want to pick up on one aspect of the organization of this book that you just touched on. So you have, you have five sections. Each section starts with a contributor writing really insightful, you know, critical commentary on an aspect of Matthews's work. And I, I think that there was a, there's kind of a challenging trade-off that, that, that you folks really artfully uh, navigated. And I'm just wondering if I could present it and get your thoughts on it. And it's a trade-off between, between clarity and, and richness. And so I think that if you were to want to just write a book that could be completely easily digested in the same way that like a textbook would be, you'd probably want to constrain your contributors so that they're just commenting on the sections that their commentary is ostensibly about based on its position in the volume. But if you want to you know, maximize richness, you're going to want to give them the freedom to be able to draw you know, connections between different parts of the book. And I think that you know, it's, it's a challenge to, to navigate these, these, uh, the, these two things. And I'm, I'm kind of wondering how you thought about this challenge. Was this something that you were aware of? And if you were, you know, what, how, did you, how did you go about navigating it? That is really interesting. Um, yeah, it is something we were aware of um, because we wanted uh, to emphasize the critical reevaluation. Um, and I just, I, I say this again and again, because when people talk about you know, Matthew Littman and Ann Sharp and Gareth Matthews, and, um, uh, there's sort of a laudatory uh, way that people often talk about them, uh, which is justly deserved. But we did not want this project to be seen as just a way, as I say, of celebrating or of um, commemorating these folks. We wanted we wanted to people to take their scholarship seriously, and so because we charged the uh, contributors to the book. Uh, to do that. Um, so we, for example, we asked them in each of their essays, please um, talk about who their influences were. Like, so I'll just talk about Matthew. Who were Matthew, uh, Gareth Matthews' influences, his major philosophical influences, and um, what were his original contributions did he make in the field that you're looking at? Um, what influence did his scholarship have both on, on other philosophers, on other people and educators, and also in the field? Um, and uh, how from today's perspective in that field, because as fields evolve all the time, um, what what now can we see as maybe some of his weaknesses or his oversights and what are some of the things he contributed that are still strong and important in the field? And you know, that's a lot of, that's a lot to take on. And so because we were asking all of our contributors to do that, um, we really didn't ask them to try to make connections, but we also knew that they sort of naturally would because uh, the, 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 the themes that I, talked about before that I mentioned there's there's quite a, there is quite a bit of overlap um, and so they did uh, some of them um, uh, did refer to uh, issues that other people were writing about in other chapters but then Megan and I took that mainly as our responsibility to make those connections and so we did that partly in the in the uh, biographical introduction that we wrote um, in the book wrote for the book and then also uh, we made a number of cross-reference footnotes um, in the chapters, uh, both in the chapters, the reprints from Matthews and the original essays by these contributors. So that um, when someone was talking about something that had been elaborated in another chapter, we would put a cross-reference footnote to that. Um, and 
as this project developed, um, I think it's important to say that Megan and I realized um, that this book was not going to offer people sort of a unified uh, picture of like the Gareth Matthews, that what we were going to get would be a number of different versions or aspects of Gareth. And we, we decided that that was, uh, that would make the book rich. So we were, we were happy about that. Huh. Were there any parts of the book just following up on this where you thought we were getting like, like two radically different pictures of who Gareth Matthews was or what he was about? Maybe one tension would be, uh, between sort of the analytic Gareth Matthews, the analytic philosopher and Gareth Matthews, the uh, the playful guy, the playful philosopher. Um, in his, his writing is quite analytical. Um, he uses formulae, for example, all the time. Um, and in in uh, in a few of the transcripts we have, you can sort of see him uh, using that, using that strength, his analytic strength, to sort of to uh, organize the dialogue. Um, but a lot of other people who describe him and were there. Um, don't see that or the you know they emphasize how playful he was and and how what uh, how, how humorous he was and how creative he was um and that he was not trying to sort of box things into a formulaic system that we that in order to work on it and how do you think he would respond if like he were shown these two different pictures where somebody says no he's the he's the playful guy like and then somebody else says no look at all these these formulae he's an analytic philosopher yeah. i think he would say yeah they're both true <laughs> Yeah, and they and they both feed each other. Like, you can't really do uh, analytic philosophy well without a sense of humor, without crazy creativity. You know, if if otherwise you're misunderstanding what it means to do analytic philosophy. I think that comes out in his writing. Uh, right. He's a he's a pleasure to read. Unlike many <laughs> philosophers and even people in philosophy for children, he's just he's a you can tell he's really enjoying taking great joy in in what he's doing. So one example that comes to mind when you're talking about this juxtaposition of the playfulness and the analytical rigor is his discussion of Lucretius and the thought experiment about whether the universe is uh, like, like, like has an edge, whether it's bounded. And the thought experiment is, well, if you throw a javelin at it, is it going to, is it going to stop? Because if it's going to stop, then it means that there's something like behind it. There's like a wall. And if it doesn't stop, then well, it's, it's, it's keeping going and we haven't found a boundary to the universe. And what I think is characterized in his discussion of that is both this commitment to really clearly stating your arguments, giving formal premises, and so, so that we can examine the different premises, but then also this sense of like joy and wonder at the different counter arguments that the children he was working with would come up with. And so I guess, yeah, when, when you're talking about that, that, that's one part of the book that comes to mind for me. And I would, I would highly recommend, you know, if you get a copy of it, take, take a look there. Do you, have, do you have a page number, Megan? Do you know where that is in the book? Yeah, it's pages 113 to 116. Okay, yeah. So head on over yeah. to 113 to 116 if, if you want to see what we're talking about. Yeah. Uh, I think that's another uh, great example of um, uh, Matthew's had this knack of identifying sort of some of the perennial philosophical questions that uh, that begin in childhood. And this is one of them, like wondering about, does the universe have an end? Is something that a lot of people start wondering about as kids, and, but even as adults, it's something we're still fascinated by. And the more we learn about about space, um, about astronomy, that still, it's, it's uh, the more fascinating it becomes. And I think also just to, on that example, um, Gareth did, uh, trust and demonstrate that the kids, these young kids could handle some formula, some like formulaically stating those premises and, as a way of examining the question. Um, but that, that uh, it also prompted their creativity. I think in that the one, there, there's a one child in there who said, well, what if you throw the javelin and it disappears that way, but it comes back around the other way, like in a video game. <laughs> and uh, Matthews was just delighted at that kind of creative thinking. Yeah. And if I could just follow up, I think there are places in his writing too where he acknowledges that it was the children's thinking about these perennial puzzles that shifted his own thought and really allowed him to think differently about the puzzle, think better about the puzzle. And he says this explicitly in the case of the Ring of Gyges, that um, the ways in which these young children complicated that thought experiment 
um, really allowed him to think about it in ways that he hadn't done before. So he appreciated the, the, the creativity of the children's thought, but also saw within that creativity, like real philosophical potential in um, addressing these perennial questions. We often think about two different types of philosophers, the philosophy done by adults and the philosophy done by children. And when you're talking about the Ring of Gyges or the Lucretius Javelin thought experiment, it seems like Matthews is thinking about there being a lot of continuity between what children are doing and what adults can do, where the children are making actual contributions to these questions, rather than just engaging in some activity that's, that, that's only and merely preparatory to f proper philosophy. And I'm wondering if you could just talk a little bit about how how he saw the continuity and the discontinuity between philosophy as practiced by children and adults? Yeah, that, that's a great question because I think that um, Matthews was himself preoccupied by that question um, throughout his, his life. I think he did see um, continuity between adult and um, children's philosophizing in part because he thought perplexity was so central to philosophizing and that um, perplexity is something that children have, you know, if not more than what adults have. Like adults are inclined to lose that sort of sense of wonder and curiosity and perplexity about the world um, in a way that... Um, children sort of are sort of involved in. If you think of the thought experiment about, um, you know, the javelin and whether the universe is bounded, you know, maybe as an adult, unless you're a professional philosopher, you might not be as preoccupied by that question, but children really are, and they're kind of genuinely preoccupied. So he thought there was tremendous continuity. And he also thought, in you know, in relation to that continuity, that children's philosophizing and children's philosophy should be published. Like it, it, it's really just a function of discrimination that we don't take seriously children's art and children's philosophy. Um, so, so I do think he was very committed to that idea and that was part of what it was to respect children and, and part of what it was to come into a conversation respecting his interlocutors. Um, you know, thinking that they were going to make as valuable a contribution as anyone else in the history of philosophy. I think in terms of the discontinuity, and I don't know what you think, Morn, but I think he thought that philosophizing with children was of tremendous value to adults and to professional philosophers just because children... Um, could reawaken in adults that sense of perplexity that had maybe been lost. And he does, you know, even though he thinks of analytic philosophy or, or practices analytic philosophy in a very playful way, he does think that within analytic philosophy, you're taking that perplexity and turning it into a problem that you can solve. And whilst that's valuable and important, you don't want to lose the perplexity that motivates it. And, mm. and children um, allow you to reconnect with and rediscover the perplexity that motivates a lot of the philosophical problems that are treated within the context of professional or analytic philosophy. Um, and I, I do think that he thought that you know, adults had, you know, there were differences as well. Um, you know, adults had more experience with the world. In many ways, they have more knowledge available to them. And I think he thought that in some ways, at least in the context of philosophizing, that can be a limitation and not a strength. You know, in many areas of our life, Having knowledge and experience is a strength, but in the context of philosophy, it's not always a strength. So he developed this idea that, I think he called it the mirror image of childhood, that, you know, some of the ways in which we think of the strengths of adulthood um, 
and the weaknesses of childhood, you know, get inverted in his thinking about the mirror image and that there are actually strengths of childhood like creativity, like um, perplexity that we lose as adults. And, and we need both. Like we need that intergenerational dialogue to enrich each side, um, children and adults. So, yeah, that's a little of my thinking about it. I don't know if you want to add anything. No, I think that that's wonderful. Um, uh, Matthew's, I'll just add Matthew's thought of philosophy as um, sort of natural to the human condition um, at every age, uh, like music. He, he once compared it to music. Like, why wouldn't we, why, why would we think the children wouldn't take delight in philosophy like they take delight in music and art at a young age? Um, and he did think that, um, particularly with philosophy and with art, uh, that we do some of our best work as children. And it's hard to maintain the quality of that work in philosophy and art as we get older, unless we're really encouraged and supported in doing that, which he said that, the, of course, the most education systems do not do. And so that was sort of one of his crusades to, to make a place for philosophy in schools. Um, I will say this was also one of the points of critique of Matthews that came out in the book uh, yeah. was that in order to say that, in order to say what Megan just said, all those things, you have to have you have to have some kind of idea of what you mean by philosophy. Mm -hmm. um, in order to say that children are great at doing philosophy and that they bring these special, um, they bring sort of unique strengths to the practice of philosophy. Um, what counts as a strength in practicing philosophy that depends on your conception of philosophy. And of course, Matthews had his own um, conception of philosophy and it was sort of traditional Western analytic tradition philosophy. And so one of the ways he's been critiqued is, to, is that um, he didn't, uh, he, he may not have recognized other kinds of strengths that, that children and adults have in philosophy that, um, um, that, are, are not sort of the analytic tradition or the, the way the ways in which he was familiar with doing philosophy. And, and, and we think Megan and I both thought that was a, that was a fair critique. And also the, the, the similarly with um, identifying philosophy in children's literature, the kinds of puzzles, the kinds of philosophical perplexities and puzzles he was able to identify in children's literature necessarily come from his own experience uh, in a particular philosophical tradition. Hmm. And uh, Megan and I, we, I think we say this in the introduction, we don't see that as a, um, as necessarily a problem, uh, as long as we, as there's the understanding that what, we need people from many different philosophical traditions to do the same kind of work. You couldn't expect Matthews or anyone else to um, identify uh, philosophy in children's liter for, literature, for example, for every kind of philosophical tradition. You need people who are actually experts in those traditions and who've been brought up in those traditions to do that work. Hmm. So one thing that uh, strikes me about what you were just saying is that there's there's like a gap between children and adults, and we each bring different skills to the table. And what's really important is that we don't uh, destroy the child. We don't we don't destroy the childlike part of the inquiry by just adding too much logic and rigor. And I'm reminded of like David Kennedy's work on this subject, where he talks mm -hmm. about how. To be a good teacher, you have to impose without imposing fully. If you're not imposing at all, then you're not really doing any sort of facilitation. If you're imposing fully, you're the only person in the room now. And I'm wondering what kind of practical advice Matthews might give for somebody who wants to philosophize with children while still you know, offering the, the, the tools that we have as adult philosophers, but without destroying the child in the process. Mm. That's such a wonderful question. I, I'll say a few things, maybe Megan can step in. Um, the first thing that occurs to me is that um, Matthews uh, was sort of this quintessential uh, practitioner uh, where we talk about someone who has a philosophical ear, hmm. meaning I'm gonna introduce something to the children like a frog and toad story and I'm going to see what interests the kids to talk about. But as I'm listening to them, I'm listening with my philosophical ear. So I'm sort of at the same time, really letting them take ownership of the dialogue. I'm going to be facilitating in ways that from my perspective, you know, with, with my expertise, I know that are fruitful for a, for a really meaningful, engaging philosophical dialogue. Yeah. I was, I was thinking too, Mon, 
of um, this sort of technique that he had that was unique to Matthews, which was he would write these stories. You know, well, though it was story beginnings, and he take them into the classroom and he'd invite the students in the room to have a conversation about the story beginnings. And then he would go away and continue the story, continue what happens in the story based on what the students discussed. And then he would bring the story back and sort of ask them if that was a fair representation of what had gone on in the context of the discussion. And then, you know, having established that, they would go on to have further discussion. And so what strikes me about that is it was a very kind of consultative process, but it was also one in which he was giving a certain form to the discussion, but always checking in with them to see if the form that he was giving to the discussion was in their view an accurate reflection of their thinking. Um, and so that seems to me a, a way in which you can be a strong facilitator, but not, um, but retain some of the, the kind of childlikeness of the students. And, um, and I think by all accounts, it was really successful. It was a successful way to do philosophy particularly with younger children. Hmm. I think something we said earlier uh, builds on that exact thing. The idea that, um, I think you said it, Megan, that uh, he put he put the perplexity into a form that could be worked on. I really like the way you said that, that the, the, the children would identify perplexity or he would introduce one that they would latch on to and as genuine, um, but then to to, to frame it maybe in such a way that uh, we can see how we might work on it through our discussion was he had a real gift for that. And that's something that his college students talked about as well, that he was able to do. Mm -hmm. hmm. And I, I think the fact that he often used children's literature as a stimulus is partly, you know, reflects mm -hmm. that commitment, that dual commitment, both to the philosophical um, thinking philosophically about an issue, but also retaining some of the humor and creativity and joy that comes with just reading good children's literature. Hmm. So it sounds like in everything that he was doing, he wanted to use formal tools and use formal structure in such a way that we're never losing sight of what's animating the the philosophical impulse, whether it's the creativity, whether it's the appreciation of whimsy, whether it's just the feeling of perplexity, um, all of that needs to be served by the tools we're coming up with. And it should never be something where the tool is the most salient thing. Is, is that a fair summary of some of the, the threads? I think that's very, very nice. Very much, yes. Yeah, I like the way you put it. Well, thanks. And one thing that comes like, one thing I was thinking about in what you were just saying was was your work on the the procedurally directive approach to teaching mm -hmm. like controversial issues, where what you're doing is talking about all these these formal moves, all these discussion moves, rather than saying here's what the right answer is. You're you're, you're creating an environment where the dialogue can take place, and it sounds to me like that's what we're describing with with Matthews as well. You 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 build the box, you build a safe place for the conversation to be able to actually happen. But it's all in the service of, of the inquiry that the students are ultimately engaging in. Yeah, and I think as Megan said before, it's a, it was one of his real attributes that um, even though, of, of course, most of the time when the children would discuss something with him, it's something that he himself had thought about and written about for many, many years. And so he had his own formula, you know, his own well-formulated uh, views on things, but he was able, he was really able, as Megan described in her own classroom, to take a step back from his own work on those things and wonder again, wonder again freshly with the children about it and sometimes be surprised and sometimes change his own mind. Oh. Yeah. So speaking of changing minds, I'm not sure how, I'll see if I can make this connection. Uh, I, it was really important for Matthews to change a lot of minds about like 
The Psychology of Childhood Development. And I'm thinking specifically of his critiques of Piaget and Kohlberg. And so I'm wondering if you could talk, just talk a little bit about what his critiques were of these stage theories and why it was so important for him to be able to change the discussion about how child development works and how child moral development works in order for him to make the points he wanted to make within his, his work with philosophy for children. Yeah, um, well, anyone in education knows the name Piaget and knows how tremendously influential uh, Piaget's work has been, um, and for, for very good reasons. But Matthews found that um, the philosophy he was doing with children, uh, in doing that, the children were performing these cognitive acts that the, they were really not supposed to be able to perform at their age, according to the Piaget's stage theory. And that really perplexed him. And so he, he went looking for more examples of, of children's thinking uh, and children's, uh, children's talk, children's dialogue. And at the time, um, this, was in the, this was in the early 70s, and uh, he really struggled to find any transcripts of children's talk. And he found, uh, he found a study by uh, Susan Isaacs in the 1930s in which she had long, uh, long transcripts of, of children just talking. So you could like, sort of figure out what they were thinking by, the, by what they were saying. And, uh, and he, he said, see, they're doing it there. Even in these transcripts, you can see the children making philosophical moves and making cognitive moves that they shouldn't be able to make according to Piaget. So that really fascinated him. Uh, it was a problem for, for Matthews. Um, the Piaget theory was a problem for him uh, first, I think, because it was just a barrier to, uh, as you say, changing people's minds about the importance of uh, children's philosophy, of, of providing children an opportunity to do philosophy. And in fact, um, we, we do know that um, in the early days of the philosophy for children movement, um, there were a number of skeptics and a number of critics who wrote about um, that this was not a good idea and, and used Piaget to argue against uh, having philosophy in schools. So that was one problem. Um, I think more importantly for Matthews though, it um, the stage theory, Piaget's theory, fueled a kind of adultism and a disrespect for children's thinking um, that, that, that really offended him because he thought children, even very young children should be respected and their thinking should be taken seriously. As Megan said, it should even be published, Matthews believed. Um, so that was a problem. And then as we've talked about, he thought that uh, adults and children need to philosophize together, that they both get something out of that exchange, of that intergenerational exchange. And so Piaget's theory was a, was a barrier to that as well. He both critiqued Piaget's methods uh, and then his, his conclusions, his findings. And for example, in his methods, um, it was clear to, and, and I should say that Matthews is mounting a philosophical critique of Piaget. So he's doing philosophy of psychology, which is a really important thing. Um, one of the, one of the criticisms he made was that when a child would say something, um, nonsensical or, you know, so the seemingly off topic, uh, Piaget would categorize it as, um, like a, a category mistake or a thinking mistake or a cognitive weakness. Whereas Gareth Matthews saw it as philosophically provocative, as a, as a philosophical move, and so he, I think he 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 uh, he accuses Piaget of sort of um, uh, uh, not even allowing for the possibility that children might be thinking philosophically because uh, anything they said that might count as philosophy was sort of discounted um, as childish, as as a, as a, as being in the wrong stage. And I think that speaks to the importance of having. Like significant training in philosophy when you're when you're working with children. So one of the things you mentioned earlier was that a good practitioner of P for C is going to be able to see where there's philosophical fruitfulness in what children are talking about. So you should be able to 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 listen and say, oh, there's the there's the beginnings of Zeno's paradox, or that person is articulating something that looks kind of like utilitarianism, or that looks a little bit like Kant. And then you can kind of nurture that and you can ask people more questions and you can see kind of the, the fruits of these major ideas. And so what, one of the things I found really exciting about the critique of Piaget from the book was exactly what you're talking about. If you literally don't have a mind that's finely tuned to noticing the fruits of philosophical inquiry, you're just going to miss it and you're going to miss, you're going to mischaracterize it. So that, yeah, that was a really interesting critique. 
That's right. And I let me just say one more thing about his critique. Um, Piaget's theory, according to Piaget's theory, the stages of developmental psychology um, are uh, are caused by um, sort of physical the physical maturation of the of the of the brain of the and the body, and so it's really impossible. Um, it's like literally physically impossible to perform certain kinds of uh, cognitive acts before you have developed um, the the structural. Uh, synapses the the structural wherewithal to do that. <laughs> Matthews did not um, deny that there's such a thing as developmental psychology, but for him, um, we advance in our thinking. Our 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 cognition grows through use uh, in a community of thinkers and in a language community. And this was another reason he thought that he championed um, children's philosophical thinking, children's um, opportunities to practice philosophy, because that's the way in which we get more sophisticated. So young children um, will latch onto concepts uh, as paradigm cases like cat or dog, uh, but then they get more and more sophisticated about the uses of those in metaphors and fuzzy, uh, 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 fuzzy instances where you can't quite tell what category it belongs to. And um, this was particularly important for Matthews when it comes to moral psychology, hmm. because he talked about, uh, for example, the concept of a lie. Uh, and how um, the same kind of moral maturity, uh, the, the, the trajectory of our moral maturity follows the same uh, path, that we begin with these simple paradigm cases of not telling the truth. But then as we, as we grow and as we interact with our community and we get, have more and more experience, we become more sophisticated about those concepts. And um, being able to philosophize about moral concepts is really integral to our ability to mature morally for Matthews. Yeah. And if I could just, um, you know, echo what Morn said, it means that you don't enter morality at a certain age. Mm. I mean, you're grasping these paradigms from a very early age, like bravery, like lying. And so um, this idea that, um, you know, the idea that children somehow are pre-moral, I mm. think he also found kind of deeply offensive. Okay. So I could imagine like like a young child growing up in a Catholic community and they learn a little bit about bravery, they think about standing up to a bully, they think about standing up to, um, you know, maybe answering a question in class, something like that. Mm -hmm. Then they might start to learn about the saints and they're learning about people making great sacrifices in order to, uh, you know, stand up for their views. And then I could imagine they see some counter arguments. They might see somebody who's standing up for their views, but they think that the views are really morally abhorrent. And now they're thinking about whether bravery has to have a normative component. Can there be brave terrorists? Questions mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. And so, so this is kind of the picture that I'm grasping from what you're saying about how they might start to gain these moral concepts, where it's not just like an on-off binary thing. It's you get the, these proto-concepts based on like extensive definition almost, mm -hmm. you start to generalize, you're doing reflective equilibrium, basically, and getting a more and more advanced concept. Mm -hmm. And one thing that's coming out of this is that we're, we're in the pursuit of answers to philosophical questions. And that's something that sometimes people like have a stereotype about philosophy that we don't care about answers, and that all we want to do is just ask more and more questions. We're like uh, question connoisseurs. And there's something right about the fact that we do like good questions, but but while we're on this subject, can you talk a little bit about how important answers were for Matthews? Yeah, I think that um, that marks a difference between Matthews' approach and um, the approach of Matthew Littman and Anne Sharp. Um, they, the, Littman and Sharp were a, a little more comfortable with the conversations being a little more open and wide-ranging. And... I think for Matthews, it really was important to come to at least a provisional answer, or if, if not a provisional answer, at least an understanding that some of the answers that were tested in the context of the conversation are better than others. And I think he thought it was important because the level of investment in the question 
the formulation of the question, as you were saying, Aaron, you know, we like good questions, but the effort involved in formulating a good question and then the effort involved in um, discussing that question, I think he believed that you have to feel that something's at stake. And because he was so focused on philosophical puzzles, there's not the feeling, at least directly, that what is at stake is that you're going to make better judgments in your life, um, which in the case of Littman and Sharp, often because of the nature of what they were discussing, there was this sense of, well, you know, this is going to help me in making um, a decision about X or Y. But I think in the case of Matthews, because he was so invested in these puzzles, like whether the universe is bounded, in order for the students to feel that there was something at stake in the inquiry, uh, I think he had to kind of emphasize that the reason we're doing this is so that we get a better answer than what we might have otherwise had. So that's part of it. And I also think he himself, just being a professional philosopher, was also incredibly invested in the answer. Like, I'm doing this in part because I want to benefit from the discussion. I want to sort of move towards a better answer. Um, and I also think that he thought that it, it was a way to organise the conversation um, thinking back to our earlier discussion about form without it being imposed or without um, every aspect of the conversation being imposed by the facilitator. I think if you're all committed um, to, to getting a, a better answer or an answer that you, you know, you're at least reasonably happy with within the context of um, the inquiry, then that's a way for you to become sort of self-organizing such that it's not always about the facilitator imposing a certain kind of discipline or a certain kind of order or certain, um, you know, certain determinations about who speaks and who doesn't. So I think in his mind, he was very wedded to having the students see that um, what was going on was not arbitrary. It, it had its own kind of, it was organized by both the formulation of the question and the commitment then to what answers that question. So when I think about the, your, your typical you know, leading figure in the philosophy of the children movement, I think about pragmatists. I think about people who have theories of truth that are very much grounded in Dewey and Peirce and, uh, and James. And one thing I'm, that I heard in what you were talking about was that Matthews was interested in figuring out the truth. He was interested in trying to figure out the answers to questions. And that that pursuit was different than Littman's pursuit of trying to figure out practical rep recommendations for living. And I'm wondering if that reflects like a, like a difference in their theories of, of truth. Like was, was Matthews more of a correspondence theory of truth person where Littman and Sharp were more, more pragmatists about this? Yeah, that, I think that's a great question. And I certainly think that I can say sort of with confidence um, that Littman and Sharp did have a pragmatist theory of truth. And I'm going to let Morn speak to that a little more. I think in the case of Matthews, though, I'm not sure you could say he had a correspondence or a coherence theory of truth. Like, like I'm not sure he was sort of thinking in quite those terms. I think he was a little more influenced by his studies of Plato and, and maybe Augustine too. I, I just know Augustine less well. But I think for, if you think about Plato at least, I think for Plato there's a commitment to the idea that there is, there is a kind of truth of the matter. Oh, yeah. um, and the, the work involved is, is getting to that. And we may never get to that. You know, it's a regulative ideal. Um, but it certainly has to inform what it is we think we're up to. And we certainly need to be able to see a kind of movement with respect to that regulative ideal. 
I, I, you do get the sense, reading Matthews, that, that truth was at least a regulative ideal for him, that it was important for him. Um, and and uh, in, in talking about the importance of making progress in a philosophical dialogue and progress, uh, progress on the question, um, that was animated by this idea that there is something to get to. Um, we, as Megan said, we might not get there or get there completely, um, but we're going to make some progress. And rec- being able to recognize that you've made progress was uh, important in the way uh, we frame the question. And so, as we said before, the way he the way he could take a perplexity and frame it in a way that we would be able to make progress on it was really important. Um, and Peter Shea talks about this in the book about how there was always this drive for closure um, that. Uh, no matter no matter how long we have for the dialogue, if it's just one class period, for example, at the end, Matthews would really like to take a, a sum a su- to sum up what has happened and how far have we gotten on the question and where would we go next so that people could sort of track the progress they were making. Um, yeah, and with with Matt and Anne, as Megan said, they were more uh, comfortable with a with a free ranging dialogue. Uh, for Matt in particular, what was important, I think, was um, practicing good thinking moves and the good inquiry moves. Um, And one of the reasons, one of the things that became really obvious in the book to us as we're working on it was um, Matthews uh, was not, um, he didn't really get into philosophy of education and he didn't primarily see philosophy for children as an educational program. In other words, that the the main benefit was, was in educating children, teaching them how to think better and teaching them how to philosophize. Um, as we said, it's just philosophy is part of the human condition. And so children have a right to do it and they do it well. So we should be doing it with them. Um, Matt and Anne were concerned that uh, they did believe that children had the capacity to philosophize, but they thought that, um, that that it was important to give children models of how to do that. And so this is one of the reasons Matt Littman wrote his novels. Uh, the novels sort of are give um, cognitive uh, modeling to the children about how you do this. And um, so so in a discussion with children, Matt Littman, for example, would be paying close attention to the moves they were making, the cognitive moves they were making in the community of inquiry. And uh, his interventions would be to try to get them to, uh, be, first of all, become aware in a metacognitive way, become aware of the kinds of moves you're making. Like if I'm making an inference, if I've just said something that was covering up an assumption, um, to be aware of that and uh, and uh, maybe to have other people point it out to you and then to be able to evaluate those moves. What was, what was the strength of that? But was that a good inference? Um, is that a reasonable assumption to make? Um, am I really building on what someone said before or am I, am I taking this in a very different direction? So getting better at making those kinds of moves and making those kinds of judgments, as Megan said, um, Matt and Ann both really thought that was really crucial to a well-lived life. I'm, what's starting to emerge is a picture of the difference between what a CPI that you know lip, that, that that Matt or Anne were, were facilitating versus one that um, Gareth was was facilitating, and I, I'm just gonna I want to push you on that because I want to have a clearer picture of that. So imagine you're walking down the hallway in the world's greatest school, and you pass by one room, and there's Anne doing a CPI, another one there, there's Matt, another one there's uh, there, there's Gareth, and Tell me, like, just in concrete detail, what is going to be going on in those different rooms? How are they going to look different? So, as I said, uh, Matt Litwin would be paying close attention, I think, to the the kinds of thinking moves people were making. And um, as a facilitator, he would be inviting them to become aware of those moves and to evaluate those moves um, and to get better at, at, at making those moves. And in doing so, it wouldn't matter where the conversation was going. In other words, um, practicing making good thinking moves and good inquiry moves was more important than making progress on the question. For Anne, I think what was distinctive about Anne, she was also interested in the in the those cognitive moves. But Anne, I think, was just as, if not more, interested in um, in community building and in in getting people to really take on each other's ideas in a very personal way and respond to each other in a personal way. So she was interested um, in the cohesiveness of the philosophical community. When, Aaron, when you were saying CPI, the, or we should let people know that's the community of philosophical inquiry, which is what Lemon and Sharp, the term they used. Building the cohesiveness of the community um, and getting people to develop real deep appreciation and even fondness for each other as members of this 
of this collective effort, I think was um, just as important, if not more important for Anne than making an advance on the inquiry. For Anne too, she, she, she was so committed to inclusion. Mm. Like, so she would often take, you know, someone with a less popular idea or a less well articulated or idea or someone who was kind of acutely sort of nervous about being in that setting. She would often um, draw them out and bring them in and, and model for the rest of the community, like what it is we're here to do which is to build, as Morn said, this cohesive um, community. Uh, it was really striking to see her in action, to see her doing that. I think it's a lovely way to formulate yeah. the difference between her and Matt. If, if the IAPC were to ever canonize people, I could imagine from what you're saying, um, Anne being the patron saint of care for the community, Gareth <laughs> being the patron saint of care for the inquiry, and uh, Matt being the patron saint of uh, critical thinking in terms of understanding the different, <laughs> is, is that 10% um, right? or That's not bad at all. Not bad. <laughs> but, you know, I think an, another feature of Anne related to um, your point about, you know, she would be the patron saint of sort of caring for the community. I think that's really true. But I think of the three of them, Mm -hmm. Anne was also the most committed to the idea that part of the purpose of the community of philosophical inquiry is to surface a certain kind of radicalness. Okay. You know, mm -hmm. she was really invested in radical ideas, like, like this being a space in which we can really take flight um, intellectually, politically, ethically, aesthetically. And I think because Matt and Matthews in their different ways were kind of committed to um, either the thinking moves or making progress. Mm. I think of the three of them and saw it as, um, saw it as a venue for kind of, saw it as having the potential for really transformative engagements no, that didn't come out right. It's like, do you know what I mean, Morn? Like yeah, of the I, I do. I, I, well, part of what you mean, I think, is that um, of the three of them, Anne was the most um, uh, the most declarative about the importance of uh, inviting children to um, philosophize about social issues and mm. to be to be social critics. Um, Gareth Matthews wrote in one of the reviews. Of the of a children's book that children can and should be social critics, but Anne really elaborated on that. I mean, she really made that central to her practice. She she expected that um, children need to take on these kinds of issues, uh, and that they that society needs the benefit of children's thinking about these issues. Okay, so I'm seeing like a a strong contrast between Anne and like Hannah Arendt with like her, the crisis of education, where she'd be explicitly opposed mm. to that kind of thinking. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think Anne would be. Um, so I'm thinking of Arendt's yeah. discussion of how, like she thought that children should be educated. Oh, sorry, what did you say? Yeah. Well, the, the idea that they should be protected. Yeah, they like, should be protected. We have to protect the new from the old, protect the yeah. old from the new, educate children, don't educate adults, let adults do politics. And it yeah. seems like um, all these thinkers in different ways are breaking that down, where Matthews mm -hmm. wants to have the old and the new interact in dialogue. And mm -hmm. it sounds like uh, Anne wanted wanted the, 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 the new, the young to be engaging directly and thought about radical political transformation. And religious. Um, we know that uh, Matt... He wrote one essay on um, philosophy and religious education okay. in which he thought that if, if you're doing religious education, then you should be using philosophy as one of the ways that you do that. Mm. But he sort of went out of his way to avoid uh, bringing religion or religious ideas or conflicts into his novels, into the, the kinds, including them in the, in the issues explicitly that would be, children would be invited to philosophize about in his curriculum. Whereas Anne thought that, um, they should, and as anybody who's done philosophy with children knows, they always bring up religious questions, always, no matter what you're talking about. You can't avoid it, nor should yeah. you. 
and Anne just delighted in that and welcomed it. And she, Anne wrote about um, parallels between uh, a religious life and a philosophical life, which for her were sort of like blended or sort mm. of really inextricable from each other. And she just, I think she just assumed that it would be the same for most children. Huh. Another thing that's coming up is how the, uh, an inquiry is going to begin. And so I imagine that between these three thinkers, you're going to get divergences in both the, the choice of stimulus, like what your jumping off point is, the, the thing that's inspiring the discussion, and then also where the, 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 the questions are coming from. Because one thing that, that struck me about your book was that sometimes it seems like Matthews would go into a discussion, or yeah, it sounds like he would go into a discussion with a question that was inspired by, a, and then he'd present a dialogue that he'd written. Uh, I'm thinking about the Euthyphro dilemma discussion in particular. Mm -hmm. And uh, my understanding of Lippmann is that there'd be a democratic voting procedure, but, but tell me, tell me more about how that might look different. It's an important difference. Yeah, it's quite a, it's a striking difference. Um, I think it, and I think it really stems from uh, Matt's and Anne's pragmatism um, mm -hmm. that they, they thought the questions should come from the children. Um, they saw philosophy among other things as just um, opening up the meaning of children's ordinary experience in philosophical ways, like children have ethical experience and children have aesthetic experience. And, um, children have metaphysical questions already. So um, helping children wake up to those philosophical dimensions of their own experience was one of the main, and that comes from pragmatism. And so that, yeah, that for, for Matt and Anne, especially that was, um, that was sort of a, a, a law that you, you don't impose questions on the children. You see what they're interested in. If you're doing philosophy time and the children want to talk about something that's really not philosophical or doesn't seem likely, then you might find ways to find philosophical aspects of what they are talking about and try to bring that up. That's okay for them to do, but otherwise, um, and then you, as you said, um, um, you, when you invite a group of children to do that, there will be many different questions that come up and there has to be a way to manage that agenda so voting is one way we let the children vote on which to start with and which to go next. That's one way we do it. Yeah. Um, and you're right for Matthews. And I, I do think this is, this draws on what we were talking about. His, his interest in formulating the question in a way that he knows that we can, or he's confident we can make some progress on that we can recognize. So he was very comfortable bringing in not only a book that had a, a children's story that had a particular philosophical puzzle in it, not a number of puzzles, mm -hmm. um, but also maybe bringing the question himself, like this is the story we read and now here's the question we're gonna discuss that he had taken from that. And um, in the, both in the, the, the curriculum, the, the, the teacher's guides that he wrote to some of those books, he has question sets that teachers can just use. And in the website that he later developed um, with some of his students, there's the picture book, and then there's a question set that you would bring to the children. Hmm. Yeah, so just to, I want to really narrow in on something. With, with, with Matt Lippman, you'd be using his philosophical novels, and these are really rich texts that suggest lots and lots of different philosophical questions, and anything could come out of it, and you want to let the children decide which question they're going to talk about. You don't impose a question. And it sounds to me like that, that was Anne's method as well. Mm -hmm. And then for, for Gareth Matthews, the uh, one difference is going to be that you're using story, like you, you can use children's literature as opposed to um, explicit, like Lippmann philosophical novels. So he would also use his own dialogues that, that he could write. So, so there might've been more variety in stimulus. And then in addition, the things that he would choose often were narrowly tailored towards one specific question, which he could then offer to the children. Um, Megan, you wanted to comment about what I said about Anne. So I'm wondering if you want to correct me. No, no, I was just, you know, I was just wanting to correct what I think is a misconception okay. about Anne and Matt's approach, just with respect to the stimulus material. Good. I think it's true that they did develop novels that were intended to raise a variety of issues and that these novels were also intended to embed the history of Western philosophy within the context of the lives of these characters, which are kids in the context of families and schools. So it was intended to kind of model what the life of the students might be like. 
But I think it's also important to stress from their perspective, and we've just been, we've just finished doing some research on this very point, that the fact that they developed this curriculum did not preclude in their own minds or in the minds of those people they trained that you, now how am I going to say, that it didn't preclude using other stimulus materials. And in fact, they, they talk and write favourably about using picture books, about mm. using um, sources from the children's lives, using film, using, um, you know, anything that might allow you to um, further the inquiry or stimulate the inquiry. It's just that they're interested in providing a curriculum that will help the teachers be much more self-sufficient in integrating philosophy into the curriculum and into the school classroom. Okay. You know, I think Matthews was focused on helping the teacher engage philosophically with students, but wasn't thinking about it, um, sort of thought about it more as a discrete activity. Um, so, yeah, so that was just something, you know, because I think it's yeah. it's often the way the contrast is drawn. Yeah. Um, and I think it's something of a mistake to think that they weren't interested in other kinds of stimulus. Part of that, I think, is explained, as, as I think we were saying, by the fact that um, that Matt and Anne thought of philosophy for children as sort of initiating children into the discipline of philosophy, uh, which involved both um, modeling for them uh, how philosophical inquiry is done in this particular way, like in the mm. community of inquiry, and also um, the sort of the the ideas and the issues that uh, that have that have come up in the in Western, at least in the Western tradition for them, the, the tr tradition of Western philosophy. So to initiate children into that centuries-long dialogue about this certain set of questions and issues was really important for them um, as a discipline and. Um, uh, I think it's 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 pretty obvious uh, today that um, the making philosophy integral to education in that way um, has not really happened yet, at least in this country. Um, and so the the philosopher in residence model that Matthews uh, sort of initiated has become um, the predominant model of philosophy in schools in this country. And by that we mean that a philosopher or a philosophy graduate student will visit a school, will bring in a children's book probably bring in a set of questions and have a dialogue with the students. That's that's mostly what's going on. Um, rather than trying to prepare teachers to do this. Um, yeah, so that that's super exciting. So I just want to make sure I'm, I'm understanding. So uh, everybody's interested in using a wide variety of materials. Sharp and Littman and Matthews, they were all interested in that. But if your goal is to create a curriculum that teachers can quickly pick up and integrate into their classrooms, you're going to want to create a bunch of philosophical novels and you're going to want to promote those novels so that people can hear about them and use them. And so that, that can give rise to the impression that Lippmann and Sharp were just interested in teaching like, you know, Harry Stottlemyre and the doll hospital and all that. But really that was, that, that was part, that impression was partly a result of, of their political or, or their, their social goal for how to integrate it rather than a limitation of what they would accept. Is that, is that yeah, fair? And also as Megan said, it, uh, uh, teaching philosophy as a discipline. Uh, um, there's this there's this lovely passage where I think it was Anne Sharp and Lawrence Splitter said, um, "You wouldn't try to teach children math by once in a while having someone can in, come in and do some fun mathematical activity with them, mm. right? Yeah. You would have to. You, it takes a systematic approach to like there the, sort of like here are the building blocks you learn at this age, and then based on that you build on this, and based on this. So if you're thinking of you know teaching philosophy or bringing children into philosophy as a particular discipline, it's got to be systematic in a way that they tried to make those novels, which could then be supplemented by as, as Megan says, all kinds of materials. Cool. Wonderful. And if I could just um, provide some evidence for the fact that they were all committed to using a variety of materials. I mean, if you think about the fact that Matthew Lippmann very early on, I think it was actually when they were founding Thinking the Philosophy for Children journal, he invited, um, or he and Anne invited um, Gareth Matthews to be a contributing editor. 
And Matthew's role as contributing editor was to write these reviews of children's books. And the review always appeared on the first page. You know, it was thinking in stories and then you'd read Matthew's review. And I, I think if, Math, if Matthew Lippman and Anne Sharp weren't interested in a wide array of materials, they wouldn't have thought to do that and they wouldn't mm. have thought to have it be on the first page. And so, um, you know, not to mention the things that they write about diverse materials. And I also think that Matthew's, in a number of places and in a number of interviews, acknowledged the value of the curriculum that Matt Lettman and Anne Sharp had developed. It's just that he was not himself interested in working with that in the context of his own practice. He was much more interested in the potential he saw in children's literature to mm. correct, connect older and younger generations and also to involve college students. So that's just to speak to the way in which you nicely describe the, the difference. Yeah. That's right. And, and also the, the fact that uh, those, that book, uh, Dialogues with Children, in which Matthews wrote those story beginnings and then dialogue. And then wrote the, so he also appreciated the, the, the opportunity, the benefits of a curricular philosophical story that was written by a philosopher who was trying to do a certain kind of thing with a group of children, like the Youth of Fro puzzle that you okay. mentioned, Aaron. Yeah. Oh, cool. Well, I'm, I'm glad we could do this because I like... It's it's valuable, I think, to put to put out the low resolution JPEG picture, and then see the flaws with it. So I'm so I'm glad we could start with this kind of conception of what they were interested in, mm -hmm. and then see how that maps onto reality. You know, the extent to which it does, the extent to which it doesn't. So I have a I have a much clearer picture now of how they used curriculum. So thank you. And Aaron, if yeah. I can. I I just think it's so important yeah. that we, we do clarify it because I think that it's in the clarification that we're going to have different kinds of debates mm. within the philosophy for children community. At the moment, I think oftentimes we're having debates about what to use, whether it's okay. picture books or um, you know novels written for the purpose of philosophical inquiry. Whereas I think what we should be doing is having debates about um, not so much what to use, but how what we use can inform what we do mm. in the context of the classroom and also how we can begin to package some of the curricular materials with the picture books so that we have a richer array of materials that people can use in the context of their own practice. So... Just personally speaking, I would love to see the movement get to a point where those are the kinds of discussions we're having. All right. Now, I want to ask one final question. So this is the question about the future. So just, yeah, what are your, what are your plans for the future of the uh, Philosophy for Children Founders series? Well, we're very excited about our plans because, and they do tend to continue to multiply. Um, so the Lippmann volume is underway. Um, we have selected the contributors, we've identified the themes, we've contracted um, with Routledge, and we're hoping to see that book come out in maybe late 2023 or early 2024. Um, which will be really lovely because in 2024, it's the anniversary of the 50 year anniversary of the Institute for the Advancement of Philosophy for Children. So that's going to be a nice moment. And, um, you know, one thing that we're doing differently with that volume related to your earlier question about clarity um, versus richness is we're involving the contributors in conversations now okay. as they're writing their pieces and we're excited to see what difference that makes to the final product hmm. um, another thing that um, Morn is doing with um, Peter Shea is they're collecting together many of the interviews that Peter Shea has been doing over the last is it 10 years Morn or, or longer a little longer than that yeah more like 15 I think 
15. You know, over the last 15 years, Peter Shea has been interviewing a lot of the people involved in the early years of the Philosophy for Children movement. And um, Morn and Peter are, are transcribing those interviews and putting them together in a collection um, that will appear in the Founders series. I don't know if you want to say anything more about that. Oh, no, no, that's, yeah, it's, yeah, okay. it's, it's so interesting to get the perspectives of other people who work very closely with Matt Ann and, and Gareth um, mm. and, and knew them in different ways and sort of drew out different parts of their personalities. It's very interesting. And a part of the reason why we thought this was important to do is because, of course, um, what we wanted to, you know, it, it can seem as though in the series we're identifying these individual figures as in somehow the founders. And we both know and other people know that it was a collective effort and lots of people were involved in different ways. And mm -hmm. we felt after having done these first three volumes, we wanted to draw attention to the other people involved and the, the various ways in which they contributed to the movement in the early years. That was really important, we felt, um, to do. And then another thing that we're involved in, um, which is sort of continues to grow, is we've gotten, I don't know sort of how this happened, but we've become increasingly interested in sort of earlier versions of philosophy for children. Hmm. Um, and that sort of ranges like from philosophers who were going into schools long before um, we were thinking about philosophy in schools as a movement or philosophy for children as a movement. We, um, it also involved like teachers teaching ethics and recording those sort of efforts. So we've become increasingly interested in that. And we've also begun to think about a lot more about kind of um, how philosophy for children might have been going on in other con countries, other cultures, other contexts, but maybe not under that name and maybe with a different emphasis, depending on the country and the culture. Hmm. And so we've become sort of interested in documenting that and also reflecting on what that might mean for how we think about philosophy for children today. And currently we're thinking of that divided into geographical regions and we're just sort of building up those different geographical regions as more and more people hear about it and get interested in contributing to it. So that's at least three ways in which um, the series is continuing. The whole point of the series, I would say, if, if, uh, if you had to reduce it to one point, is just that um, what can we learn about what's already been done um, in ways that can enhance what we're doing now and diversify and deepen the ways we think about and practice philosophy for children now. Like I had a, there was a woman in Poland who about a year ago wrote to me and said um, she was doing her doctoral dissertation and, and uh, she had discovered this Polish philosopher who had gone into schools, um, high schools, and done a lot of work in high schools and written about it. And did we know about it? And I said, no, but that's exactly the kind of thing we want to know about because hmm. there's probably things there we can learn about. A, and then B, just to learn about how, particularly if you really, if you open up what what it means to do philosophy with, with children of different ages, um, you can find so much like it's really not just this niche tiny little thing that just a few people do that it actually a lot of people have been doing things like this for years and years and years and that's tremendously exciting sometimes i think people think the story of philosophy for children is a movement from this unified community of practitioners and theorists about what it is to an increasingly diversified field okay and i and I think part of what the Founders series wants to do is also to highlight that it's always been diverse. There's mm. always been contention about what is philosophy? What is childhood? What is it to practice philosophy with children? And, and that seems to be a really important point, as Mon says, because this is not just a niche field then. 
that is sort of expanding out from this centre. It's actually always been a very dynamic, filled field. Huh. So this is wonderful. So it's it's not a project of going out and adding just more diversity to a field. It's it's discovering and sort of bringing to the surface the diversity of contributors that have always been there. I love that. Yeah. That's yeah. That's right. That's exactly right. One other thing I would mention, Megan and I have um, mm. um, just been working with our colleague Darren Chetty uh, mm. in London. Um, and Darren has been writing about race and philosophy for children for a number of years and um, been getting some really interesting responses, um, uh, including a lot of uh, criticism for what he's saying. Um, but the three of us are really uh, committed to um, also reevaluating the work of the founders and the materials they created and the children's books they identified from the perspective of gender, sexuality, race, and other poverty, social justice issues, ability, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. Um, it's something that has not really been um, taken up on a large scale within the community of philosophy for children scholars. For example, the fact that um, there's only one racially minoritized identified character in all of the Lippmann novels who was, who was identified as a black girl. Mm. Um, <clears throat> and uh, uh, the fact that um, there's not a lot of uh, racial or gender diversity in the children's books that Matthews reviewed, those 58 books. Um, and particularly today with um, the, the tremendous uh, growth, explosion of um, diversity in children's books and picture even for young, young children, right? Gender diversity and racial diversity. And um, um, people in children's literature who study these very issues um, have have a lot of insights that philosophy for children needs to learn from and take on. I think, yeah. and and we're in the process of doing that, and that's uh, that's something we're committed to going forward. Well, wonderful. Well, well, thank you so much. This has been a real thrill, real pleasure for me. Like like I said at the beginning, uh, the two of you have really influenced the way that I think about philosophy for children and education. You know, through your your published works, through especially with you, Megan, the conversations we've had over the years. You've been a fantastic mentor. Um, and then the conversations we had in Mendham back in 2018. So that was the most transformative week of my life by far out of anything I've ever done. So, you know, thank you for, for that. Thank you for this interview. It's a real honor to do this. And uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Aaron. Mm -hmm. Thank you for listening to Shusai Podcast. You can find more materials and features from the Society for the History of Children and Youth online, shcy.org.